The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He replied and said to him, teacher, all of these things I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you are lacking one thing. Go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At that statement, his face fell and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, so Jesus again said to them in reply, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and and said among themselves, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For human beings it is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. The Gospel of the Lord. My homily today is inspired by Casey's General Store that's right next door. So on Friday, Friday was a really interesting day for me. at about 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon, I was, celebra- I was uh, conducting a wedding rehearsal for the soon-to-be Jacob and Madison Burling, who were married on Saturday here in church. So the process of a wedding liturgy, when I take care of it with couples, is that you know we sit down and do all the paperwork, we do all the formation, and then on their wedding day, I ask them to write love letters about each other what they love about each other, what this relationship means to them, tell me stories that are humorous, romantic, or sentimental. So two things came up concerning their wedding that really affected me and really was a foundation for what happened for the rest of the day. They first of all told me that uh, they loved each other because they knew that they were different, but they were the same, they were good compliments to each other. Madison said when they got their new house, she would do all the work and Jake would hold the flashlight, to which I thought to myself, you're making Madison do all the work while you are holding the flashlight. So what I decided to do is I decided to go into the house and in one of my desk drawers, I ended up finding an old flashlight. Well, the flashlight needed uh, two D batteries and I did not have any D batteries on Saturday morning at six o'clock. So I went to the local Casey's general store because Casey's is open at 6 o'clock a.m., and I asked them for two batteries. The person behind the counter, she said to me, boy, you're up early getting batteries, and I explained to them that I'm the Catholic priest who's celebrating the wedding here at 2 in the afternoon, and I wanted to give this flashlight as a gift to Jacob and Madison, to which they said to me, what a cheap priest you are to give them a flashlight. That'll probably be the only time they'll ever get a flashlight in their life as a gift. And then second of all, she said to me, where is the bow for the flashlight? And I said, what bow? She said, if you're going to give a gift, you need to put a bow on it. So what I did is I went back to the house, I went to all the cheap Christmas decorations that I get at the Dollar General, and I found a bow. Now, the problem with Dollar General is that these bows, you know, you have the sticky back on it. If you're putting on a piece of paper, it's fine. But when you're trying to stick it on a flashlight, it will not stick. So I took some industrial-sized clear duct tape, and I wrapped that sucker around the flashlight. So it was like, and this is probably the most tacky thing you could give a person, is a flashlight with a cheap bow wrapped around in duct tape. That says love that you go out to that extreme to do this for them. So I gave them the flashlight, and I put it here, and came back last night to find out the flashlight was gone, which means they took the flashlight which means it may have seemed like a small little thing, but really, if you think about it, I really like the image. Because in the darkness, you know, Easter Vigil, we do this. In the darkness, you have the Easter fire outside. 
you light the Easter fire, you bless the Easter fire, and then you take the flame from the fire and you give it to everybody else's candles, and then they carry the candles in the church. And I thought about this because last year I got chided at the other parish when we did it, because when all the candles came in, I would say to them, when you take a candle and you light it, candle lighting lesson number one, you take the unlit candle and you turn it sideways, you do not take the lit candle and turn it sideways, because if you take the lit candle and turn it sideways, we're going to have another service after this, which is called the cleaning of the carpets from all the wax that dripped on the carpets. Well, people didn't listen to me last year. They ended up dripping candles on the carpets, and so the people over at St. Pat's said, we need to figure out a way to do this. So I figured out a way to do this. I went on Amazon. I bought these things. AAA batteries, and just like that, you turn the candle on, and just like that, you turn the candle off. You get the impression of the lit candles, but you don't get the wax on the carpeting. I bought 300 of these for next year's service, which will last about a year and a half until somebody steals all the candles, and then I'll have to do it all over again. But the image is important. In the darkness, you need the light. If you have one light, you can get by. But if you have an entire church that comes together and the church is filled with these things, now all of a sudden, people are able to get by. That's what couples are supposed to do for each other. Couples are supposed to take that light of Christ and shine it on the people of faith, especially their spouse, so that they know that the person is not alone. I love the image. The other image that really affected me was a song that the two really wanted and very felt part of their wedding, uh, their wedding life, their married life, and it reflected everything they were about. Now, nobody that uh, heard this song knew what it was, but immediately it stuck with me where I heard that song before because it came from a Disney Pixar movie from 15 years ago called Up. Has anybody seen the movie up. The saddest, most uplifting fifth, eight minutes of a movie you could ever watch at the beginning. You can get it on YouTube. I found it on YouTube. I put it in my death and dying course from YouTube. First eight minutes of the movie. Forget the rest of it. It's the Disney thing. It's the Pixar thing. But the first eight minutes of the movie is about a friendship that turned into a courtship, that turned into deep love, that turned into sorrow, and that turned into death. This is a Disney Pixar movie, a cartoon. They start as friends, as kids who get to know each other. She's bubbly, she's excited, he is exceedingly reserved. He and she were opposites that very much attracted his kids. They got older, they got in love, they got married. She ended up finding out that she wanted lots of kids to find out she could bear none. This is a Disney movie. She could bear none. She was devastated. So they decided that they were going to take their resources and they were going to build their house and build their life together. They renovated their house. They had a piggy bank with all the extra money. They decided they wanted to go to Peru, to this exotic place on vacation. But every time they got enough money to do it, something broke down in the house. They broke the piggy bank. They'd end up having to do something in the house. They got older. They fell more in love. They got older and finally, Carl Fredrickson decided for his wife, Ellie, no matter what happened, he was gonna get two tickets to Peru for them to fulfill their lifelong dream. They climbed up the same hill that they were kids so he could give this gift to her to find out she couldn't make it up the hill. She was dying with a debilitating disease. This is Pixar. They get to the end, she dies. His heart is broken. He doesn't know what to do because he was in so in love with someone that was so different to him that he just couldn't handle it. All in eight minutes. There's a German word for that. It's called Sehnsucht. In German, that is a word that cannot be translated into any other language. The sentiment is you are hurting so much, the pain is so much for something that you really loved but is unattainable to get, that you crave and desire it, and once you found it, to lose it breaks your heart. Better to have loved and lost 
than never to have loved at all. That was the theme that echoed itself throughout a Disney Pixar movie as Carl Fredrickson tried to navigate through life after his wife's death. I thought about that movie, and I thought about the sentiment, and then I thought about what happened after I had the wedding rehearsal. I had a seven o'clock mass in Spanish over at St. Patrick's. I went to bed on Friday night. It was an exceedingly long day. What happened that day was absolutely atrocious. I was trying to catch up on all my paperwork. At eight o'clock in the morning, I found out somebody accidentally broke the power lines by our gymnasium and the power lines were laying on the sidewalk on the uh, driveway of the house we owned right next to the gym. Nobody was available to fix it. The electricians, the plumbers, everybody was overly occupied and no one could help us out. So Artemio, El, uh, Artemio uh, Ojeda and uh, Antonio Elvier, who were here to do all the sidewalk work in front of our rectory, who did a concrete pad behind the gymnasium for the, uh, uh, for the generator that's going to be installed. They did all that work for free. We had concrete from a previous project. It didn't cost us anything. The two of them went over there and they said, if somebody touched the power box, they would have gotten electrocuted. He said, this problem needs to be resolved immediately. So the police department cordoned off the area with the tape, and we talked to the police department, but they said this area is not safe. We don't know what to do. Well, what ended up happening was a few years ago, there's a man named Rick who runs an Alcoholics Anonymous a group in uh, Moments. They were kicked out of the, Catholic, uh, the church in which they were uh, holding their meetings because the church shut down. They went to every parish in the uh, city of Moments, Catholic or non, and they were rejected for all kinds of reasons. No insurance, this or that. So they came to us. And I said to them, look, the third floor of our gym gymnasium is in disrepair. Let's do this. Let's fix up the third floor. So we ended up getting rid of all the, uh, the, the windows, replaced the windows from the BB guns and all that kind of stuff. We got rid of the bats. We got rid of the birds. We got rid of what bats and birds leave. We redid the whole place. And I said to AA, here's the deal. You don't have to pay a cent for the meetings, they, met, they meet four days a week. You don't have to pay a cent for the meetings, but this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna rebuild that third floor together. We are gonna make this thing work. It ended up costing us practically nothing. You are gonna help us protect the building by having somebody present at the building that's not likely that kids are gonna do BB guns and all that kind of stuff in the gymnasium. You are gonna help us do all the electrical. So when we built the bathrooms on the first floor of the gym, which should have cost us $70,000, which cost us less than 10, they did all the electrical. They helped us out significantly. So when I called Rick and I said, look, I can't find an electrician, can you help us out? He and his buddies, licensed electricians, came over to St. Patrick's, they took a look at the system, they fixed, they turned off all the power, they fixed the system, they rebuilt everything that was broken down, and they just charged us for the cost of the materials and nothing else, because they knew the importance of what it means to be family, what it means to do this together, that we do this together, we put our egos aside, we put our uh, desires aside, and we do it because it's the right thing to do because that's what families do. After the seven o'clock mass, I was going to bed. I had a really long day with all these things going on. Artemio and uh, Antonio rebuilt the sidewalk and the rectory patio before the insurance guy comes. There was a huge monster pile of concrete and all things left over. We got uh, a Good Shepherd Manor. I made a deal with the people at Good Shepherd. They, uh, the two religious brothers had retired. They feared that they were gonna lose their Catholic presence. I said to them, don't worry about it. I'll be on your chaplain, I will be on your board of directors, I'll take care of it. They said, how much do you want to get paid for that? And I said, I don't want to get paid for it because that's not the gospel message. The gospel message is give up all you have, including your ego, including your pride, including your well-being, that's the deal. I will take care of you, but in return, if you want to give something back, give it to the parish, give it to St. Pat's if you're really concerned about giving money. So, someone, in the community who found out about it, realized that the CCW and the Knights of Columbus did not like toting around all the tables and chairs. 
So they ended up giving the parish $10,300 to replace all the tables and all the chairs from Sam's Club. So the Hispanic community unpacked all the boxes Friday, put them all down in the basement, the chairs and the tables, and they took all the pallets and they took all the boxes and they took everything away. You would have never known that they were there in the first place. You go down to the basement of St. Patrick's Church and it looks completely different than it did because everything is bright. Everything is new. The tables and chairs, we did the same thing for the food pantry here to take care of the people who are in need. Very long day, all this happened. Finished the seven o'clock mass. I was about to go to bed. I received two phone calls as I was in bed. The first came from a gentleman named Bob. If you have been here for the last couple years when we have done our Advent uh, uh, Brass Sextet, which we'll do again this year with St. Nicholas, and Kim Emerson says we're gonna do a mini Posadas this year on December 8th. The person who helped out with St. Nicholas was celebrating with his parish a welcome weekend, and they were getting everything ready on Friday night when he got into his car to go home and he got blindsided by another car. He was sent to the hospital. He was in the emergency room. He had a major concussion. He did not feel well. He didn't know what to do. So he was beside himself. He called me. He didn't have his wits about him, so he handed the wife to his, a phone to his wife. His wife, who was his light, who was the one that was the rock, the bedrock of that family, she told me that he's doing okay, he's going to have to go through some therapy or some rehabilitation, he still doesn't have his memory, and he's not doing well, but they had six kids together. One of his daughters just got married this summer. Very, very devout family, and the first thing that Bob said to me is, do you think I'll be able to go to the welcome weekend this weekend after I got hit by a car? And I just told him, do what the doctors tell you, do what your wife tells you, just allow your wife to be that light. I got a second phone call. A woman named Cynthia. Many of you know Cynthia. 50 years. Her friend Larry has been driving her around. They've been good friends since uh, the school days. He was a few years younger. He was going to uh, be her uh, power of attorney, executor of the will. They have gotten to know each other. Just a really, really, really good friendship. Cynthia calls me last night or it's a Friday night, and she told me that Larry died on Friday, Larry Chase. She said to me she was beside herself. She didn't know what to do. So we talked. Now, luckily, there was a person that said to me over the last two weeks that they were a previous communion minister at a different parish, that they, uh, they had done so many things in the parish by bringing communion, visiting the homebound. I had two people were stealing like 20,000 hosts from me after mass to go out into the community to bring community, communion to the homebound. This is a person that used to do this at her other parish. She said to me, is there something I can do? So I talked to Emma and I talked to this woman and I talked to uh, Cynthia and I said, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Larry's not Catholic. The funeral hasn't been set up as far as I know, but on Monday morning at 9.15 at St. Pat's, Let's do a memorial service for Larry. I'm gonna be there anyway. Uh, I gotta take care of, I'm working on uh, online masses for Advent, so we're gonna stick the Advent stuff up and I'm gonna do that. I did two online masses for Advent here. I'm gonna do the two masses Monday. I said, Monday, let's do a memorial mass for Larry. He's not Catholic, but he took care of you. It was a friendship that endured for over 50 years. You are that important. You are that important. Uh, Jake and Madison are that important. Every single one of you has a gift and a light. We may not always agree. Sometimes we may not like each other, but we are obligated to love each other by the gospel message. And when someone is in need, this is what we do because that is what it means to love one another as I have loved you. There is no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And what I command to you is this, that you love one another, that you be this light. That's important to me, and that's why that wedding was so important to me because it kind of carried me through the day from somebody getting electrocuted to having the our, our Alcoholics Anonymous and Artemio Ojeda and uh, Antonio Elvier and the Hispanic community with the boxes and all the other things that happened 
That is important that we take care of those who can't take care of themselves. The person who ended up uh, asking if she could help out at the parish, she has now taken it upon herself to take care of Cynthia, to drive her Monday to the memorial service, to drive her to the doctor on Thursdays, to take care of going grocery shopping for her and to bring her communion. That is what so many people in this parish do, and we cannot forget that, which is why those time and talent forms are so important for people to get invested in this parish, to show people that we love them in God's name. I ask you to pray for David O'Connell. He contacted me Friday. He said he's going in for a procedure on Wednesday. He's asking for prayers. I ask you to pray for Bob Thompson. Bob has got the concussion. He's not doing well. He's asking for help from the family. I ask you to pray for Cynthia. Pray for Larry. Ask God to take care of him. I thought about Larry. I was telling this to Cookie. Larry was probably, whenever he came to our churches for everything, was usually the best dressed person in the church. He reminded me of Bud Case. Is that not true? <laughs> Bud Case is always the best dressed person. And with two wives that he very much loved, he has done a lot of things in this parish and he showed that much respect. We need to do the same. We need to remember those who are suffering. We need to take care of those who are in the pews. And we need to share this light with the people that we meet. This is our prayer.